money forms the most important or key part of the financial superstructure of any economy. Hence, its control becomes the basic ingredient in almost every macroeconomic policy prescription. It is crucial for this purpose to identify the main determinants of money supply. In economics, the money supply or money stock is a total amount of monetary assets available in an economy at a specific time. There are several ways to define money, but standard measures usually include currency in circulation and demand deposits, that is depositors easily access assets on the books of financial institutions. Money supply data are recorded and published usually by the government or the central bank of the country. Public and private sector analysts have long monitored changes in money supply because of its effect on the price level, inflation, the exchange rate and the business cycle. That relation between money and prices is historically associated with the quantity theory of money. There is a strong empirical evidence of a direct relationship between money supply growth and long term price inflation at least for rapid increases in the amount of money in the economy. For example, a country such as Zimbabwe which saw extremely rapid increases in its money supply also saw extremely rapid increases in prices called hyperinflation. This is one reason for the reliance on monetary policy as a means of controlling inflation. The nature of this causal chain is a subject of contention. Some heterodox economists argue that the money supply is endogenous that is determined by the working of the economy and not by the central bank and that the sources of inflation must be found in the distributional structure of the economy. In addition, those economists seeing the central bank's control over the money supply as feeble say that there are two weak links between the growth of the money supply and the inflation rate. First, in the aftermath of a recession, when many resources are underutilized, an increase in the money supply can cause a sustained increase in real production instead of inflation. Second, if the velocity of money, that is the ratio between nominal GDP and money supply changes, an increase in the money supply could have either no effect, an exaggerated effect or an unpredictable effect on the growth of nominal GDP. The focal point of this module is to provide a behavioral explanation for the changes in money supply in an economy. This requires a theoretical framework which is capable of analyzing the myriad of influences impinging on money supply arising from various sectors of the economy. This helps in identifying and analyzing the key determinants of money supply. The money multiplier theory with its foundation 
in the works of Friedman and Schwartz in 1963 and Kagan in 1965 is one such framework. It tries to relate the stock of money M to the monetary base H and through the money multiplier M to the public's preferences between currency, demand deposits and time deposits and to the bank's holding of reserves as a proportion of aggregate deposits or liabilities. Empirical validity and policy amenability of this theory makes the money multiplier framework our choice of study. The key problem of money multiplier theory lies in the stability and predictability of the reserve money multiplier. This is essential to emphasize a stable and predictable relationship between the money stock and reserve money and to emphasize the superiority of the monetary base as an instrument of money stock control vis-a-vis -vis the interest rates. After studying this module, you shall be able to know about the determinants of money supply in an economy, learn about the theoretical framework of such an analysis, identify the main factors affecting the money supply, evaluate the role of the public, banks and monetary authorities, analyze the policy prescriptions emerging out of the study. The money multiplier framework postulates a relationship between ordinary M and high powered money H where M is the money produced by the RBI, government, currency held by the public C and demand deposits DD. While high powered money H is money produced by the RBI, government and held by the public in the form of currency C and by the banks in the form of reserves R. Let us now derive the expression for narrow and broad money, which helps us identify the various determinants of the narrow and broad money stock. If H is assumed to be policy determined, supply of H is given. Looking at the demand side, that is, demand for H comes from the public for currency CD and by the bank for reserves RD. Looking at the components of reserves into required reserves RR and excess reserves ER, Dividing throughout by total deposits D, we get the expression where reserve ratio R equals the required reserve ratio RR and excessive reserve ratio E. The total reserves R are a certain proportion of total deposits D. The total deposits D are composed of demand deposits DD and time deposits TD. With H is equal to HS, we have these are the expressions for narrow and broad money. The different types of multiplier that can be derived are demand deposit multiplier, total deposit multiplier, currency multiplier, narrow money multiplier and broad money multiplier. These expressions tell us the amount by which the demand deposits, total deposits, total currency, narrow money and broad money will increase when there is a certain increase in H in the economy. Let us now understand the determination of money supply under the H theory of money supply with the help of diagram. H is measured on the vertical axis while demand deposits DD are on the horizontal axis. The supply of H is given exogenously by the monetary authorities as parallel to the horizontal axis, perfectly inelastic to DD. The CD curve has slope C, the RD curve has slope R1 plus T, the HD curve is the vertical summation of CD and RD. The equilibrium of H market is where HD and HS curve intersect, giving equilibrium level of demand deposits DD0 and currency C0. The public holds C0 amount of currency and leaves the rest H minus C0 is equal to R0 for the banks to hold and is equal to HD. Given the CD function, C0 is the amount of currency the public would like to hold 
when DD is equal to DD0. Let us now understand the equilibrium in the market for reserves with the help of diagram. Participants in this market are the monetary authority, the public and banks. The demand for reserves comes from banks and is represented by the RD curve. The supply of R to banks is jointly determined by the monetary authority and the public. The monetary authority fixes the total supply of H and then the public decides how much of H is to be held as currency and how much is left for banks to serve as their reserves. In this, the public has the first claim on H to meet their demand for currency because banks are always ready to convert their demand deposits into currency at par. Assuming actual C is equal to CD, banks have residual claims for reserves given by RS is equal to HS minus CD and given the downward sloping RS curve. The intersection of RD and RS curve gives the equilibrium level of deposits DD0. The equilibrium amount of money supply can be inferred as M0 is equal to C0 plus DD0. The crux of the above analysis is the role of secondary expansion of money supply via the production of DD. It also brings about the role of banks in the money supply changes. We could have a stability analysis to study the disequilibrium behavior too. Say, if the public holds DD1 amount of demand deposits which are less than the equilibrium amount of deposits DD0, here C to the power of D and R to the power of D and hence H to the power of D will be lower than before and H to the power of S remaining constant. There will be an excess supply of H in the H market and excess, excess supply of R in the R market. Given that the excess reserves of bank consists of desired excess reserves to meet their transactions, precautionary and speculative needs. These excess reserves are the undesired excess reserves which do not earn any income for the bank. Therefore, the bank tries to get into earning assets. Let us now understand earning assets. It can be of two types, investment in marketable securities, whether government or private, and loans and advances. The implicit assumption of the H theory of money supply is that the supply of earning assets is highly elastic at the prevailing rate of interest. So the banks move into earning assets to use their undesired excess reserves very fast to restore equilibrium. In earlier years in India, the securities market had not developed. So in times of depression, when the demand for bank loans would decline, they would be saddled with undesired excess reserves. However, the situation now is one of excess demand rather than excess supply of loans. Also, as a manager of public debt, the RBI has a perfectly elastic supply of government securities of different maturities which the banks can buy if the demand for loans slackens. When banks have undesired excess reserves and either lend or invest in securities and the borrowers spend the funds received from the banks, the recipients of funds will keep part of it in cash, rest in deposit with banks, both demand and time deposits, depending on the C ratio and the T ratio. There will be a consequent increase in DD, RD and CD and a movement towards DD0 from DD1 which continues till the banks exhaust their undesired excess reserves. The process of adjustment will be complete at DD0 level of deposits. Let us now understand the determination of bank credit. The money multiplier process embedded in the H theory ultimately results in multiple expansion or creation of bank credit, deposits and money from a given increase in edge.
we could analyze here the relationship between bank credit and bank deposits and derive a theory of supply of total bank credit to answer the question of do loans make deposits or do deposits make loans. One answer could be that for a single small bank it is deposits that make loans but from the point of view of the banking system it is loans that make deposits. A single small bank lends what it collects as deposits but the banking system as a whole collects what it lends. Another answer is that the relationship between bank deposits and credit is a circular one. So both deposits make loans and loans make deposits and they are jointly determined by a third autonomous factors and behavioral relations of the system. Let us now analyze here the relationship between bank credit and bank deposits and derive a theory of supply of total bank credit. To derive the theory of bank credit, we need to define bank credit as sum of credit to both government and the commercial sector in the form of both investment I and loans and advances LA which are a part of earning assets EA of banks. That is bank credit BC. The consolidated balance sheet of all banks can be expressed as we assume that the net worth of banks which is a liability item is equal to and offset by physical assets which is an asset item. All liabilities to the public are in the form of deposit liabilities DD and TD. It can be written as we have an equilibrium. Substituting we have this makes BC a proportional function of H where the factor of proportionality is a function of three behavioral asset ratios C, T, R. This factor is called the bank credit multiplier and is denoted by B. So we can rewrite equation as BC is equal to B C T R H. If B is assumed to be stable over time, BC will be an increasing and proportional function of H. This is the crux of the H theory of bank credit. We will now discuss the role of the public banks and monetary authorities in the determination of money supply and bank credit. The determinants of money supply and bank credit can be classified under two heads. A. Those that affect high powered money and B. Those that affect the money multiplier and the bank credit multiplier. We will have to look at factors governing edge and the multipliers and the extent to which the former can be meaningfully separated from the latter. The proximate determinants of multipliers are three behavioral ratios C, T and R which are largely endogenous and depend on the behavioral choices of the public and the banks. While the factors governing H are largely policy controlled. The RBI has two ways of influencing the money supply and bank credit. One through the high powered money H and through the required reserve ratio RR. The high powered money. The RBI can increase the high powered money by engaging in open market purchases. An increase in high powered money leads to an increase in the money supply and bank credit which is a multiple of the increase in the high powered money due to the complete money and bank credit multiplier. The required reserve ratio. An increase in the required reserve ratio reduces the money and credit multiplier and therefore leads to a reduction in the money supply and bank credit whereas a decrease in required reserve ratio has the opposite effect. and bank credit by its choice of the ratio of excess reserves to deposits ED. The factors that might affect this choice are market interest rates on loans. The market interest rate on loans influence the desired ratio of excess reserves to deposits because these interest rates are the opportunity cost of holding excess reserves. Risk of deposit withdrawals. Banks hold excess reserves mostly 
deal with unexpected withdrawals. Interest rates on borrowed reserves. A bank in sudden need for reserves can avoid calling in loans by borrowing reserves from other banks in the call money market or from the RBI through the discount facility. Let us now understand the role of banking authorities in detail. The banking system helps determine the money supply and bank credit by its choice of the ratio of excess reserves to deposits that is e to the power of d. Since higher excess reserves reduce the amount of loans the banking system creates from a given monetary base increases in e to the power of d leads to reduction in money supply and bank credit whereas a decrease in ed leads to increases. What factors might cause a bank to raise or lower its desired excess reserve ratio? The major factors are discussed below market interest rates on loans. The market interest rate on loans influence the desired ratio of excess reserves to deposits because these interest rates are the opportunity cost of holding excess reserves. Since excess reserves earn no interest when a bank holds excess reserves, it foregoes the interest it could have earned by making a loan from those reserves. The higher the market interest rates on loans or other securities a bank can purchase, the higher the opportunity cost of holding excess reserves. Thus, the desired ratio of excess reserves will decline with increase in the market interest rate on loans and other securities. Risk of deposit withdrawals. Banks hold excess reserves mostly to help them deal with unexpected withdrawals. Having excess reserves available allows a bank to avoid calling in loans, selling securities or borrowing reserves from other banks or the RBI when it faces a withdrawal of deposits. The higher the risk of withdrawals, the greater the excess reserve ratio. Interest rates on borrowed reserves. A bank in sudden need of reserves can avoid calling in loans by borrowing reserves from other banks in the call money market or from the RBI through the discount facility. Bank's ability to borrow reserves in times of need is a substitute for holding excess reserves for which they would forego the market interest rate on loans or securities. By borrowing, they can continue to be loaned up. When the interest rates paid on borrowed reserves rises, that is, when the call money rate or the discount rate rise, this option becomes relatively less attractive and the excess reserve ratio increases. This tends to reduce the complete money and credit multiplier and hence the money supply and bank credit. Public chooses its desired currency to deposit ratio which also helps determine the money supply. If people want to make more cash transactions, the desired currency to deposit ratio will increase. This will reduce the complete money multiplier and thus lead to a reduction in the money supply. The factors that might lead to a change in the public's desired currency to deposit ratio are interest rates on checkable deposits, income, the probability of bank failure, illegal activity.
now we will learn about the factors that might lead to a change in the public's desired currency to deposit ratio in detail. Interest rates on checkable deposits. Money holders choosing between currency and checkable deposits will also be influenced by the fees charged on checking accounts that is the monthly maintenance charge and fee assessed per check or ATM withdrawal. These fees are a cost of holding money in the form of deposits and when these fees increases the attractiveness of holding money in the form of currency increases which raises the currency to deposit ratio. Income The income of money holders has an influence on the currency to deposit ratio. In general, the currency to deposit ratio declines with income. Those with higher incomes rely more on the financial system than currency while those with lower incomes are more likely to use currency in their transactions. Thus, the higher the income in an economy, the lower the currency to deposit ratio and the larger the money supply. The probability of bank failure. When the probability of a bank failure rises, money holders tend to abandon deposits in favor of currency, raising the currency to deposit ratio. However, the presence of depository insurance makes bank failures less common. Illegal activity, since cash can be used, make unrecorded transactions. It is a medium of choice for illegal activities and tax evasion. In this underground economy, part of the economy is unrecorded in official measurement of economic activity and unrecorded transactions. Any increase in the transactions taking place in the underground economy will tend to increase the currency to deposit ratio and thus decrease the money supply. The exogenous money supply curve refers to the situation where the supply of money in the economy is determined by banks' preferences for excess reserves and depositors, preference for holding cash, and this preference is not affected by interest rates. Here, the complete money multiplier is constant with the money supply curve vertical. In this situation, CD, ED, and RR shift the money supply curve to the left. Since a rise in any of these variables leads to a lower complete money multiplier and thus a lower money supply, and a decrease in any of these variables has the opposite effect. The monetary base has a direct effect on the money supply. An increase in H shifts the money supply curve to the right, whereas a decrease shifts it to the left. The endogenous money supply curve is an upward sloping curve because higher interest rates lead to a greater quantity of money supply. As interest rates rise, many banks decrease their excess reserves to be able to lend out additional funds at higher rates. This leads to an increase in the amount of money in the economy because the complete money multiplier increases. Similarly, higher interest rates lead to a lower currency to deposit ratio, which works through the complete money multiplier to increase the money supply. Changes in the required reserve ratio RR or the monetary base H will shift the endogenous money supply curves in the same direction as was the case with the exogenous money supply curve. An increase in RR or a decrease in H shifts the money supply curve to the left, resulting in a lower stock of money at each interest rate. In this module, you have learned about the money multiplier framework and the determination of the narrow and broad money, demand and total deposits, and currency multipliers. The determination of total bank credit and its similarity to the money multiplier analysis, the role of the public, banks, and monetary authorities in the determination of money supply and bank credit. Lastly, you have studied about the exogenous and endogenous money supply curves.